I just want to welcome everyone to Functioning Well with ADHD and Executive Functioning Deficits. My name is Carol Eng, and I just want to tell you a little bit about um, MedPsych Associates. I'm, I work with MedPsych Associates. We are a behavioral health practice, and um, we do services in psychiatry, psychotherapy, neuropsych testings. We do comprehensive evaluations and testing in autism and ADHD. And also we offer services in executive function coaching, which is the topic for today. We also provide remote and in-person services. A lot of our clients are in New Jersey and we do service um, New York State. We're located in Ramsey, Altapan, and also Montclair, and most of our clients are children and teens and some adults. And you can find out more information about MedPsych at our website, medpsychhealth.com, and we can be found on Instagram, YouTube, and also Facebook. Um, a lot of our webinars are being posted. If you, if you miss a part of this webinar or other webinars, you can find them on YouTube and um, on our website. Okay, so let's moving on. Um, a little bit about myself. I specialize in ADHD and executive function deficits. I've been doing this for almost 12 years, um, since 2011. Um, I work primarily with a lot of students. I would say about 80% of my clients are students in middle school. Um, I have a lot of high school and a lot of college students. Um, and we typically focus on academic coaching, um, and for ad for adults, it's um, life coaching. And we, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, um, I'll, I'll present some case scenarios about um, some of the issues and challenges I work with with some of my clients. I am a master certified life coach. And of course, you can find me on medpsychhealth.com. And also I have my own website and there's a QR code if you're interested in looking me up on that website. Uh, my objectives for today, um, I assume that most of you are here because either you or either a member of your family um, have ADHD, and I, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the complexities of ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and its relationship with executive functions. Um, we're going to define what executive functions are. What are they? What do they look like? Uh, how do you identify it? And also understand its impact on academic performance and implications into adulthood. I'll also talk about seven um, tips and strategies to support weak executive skills. And um, hopefully we'll have some time to take a look at a couple of case studies and do q and A. I'm hoping my presentation will be about 45 minutes. Um, and then we'll have maybe about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. All right. So what do we know about ADHD? Um, so I'm just gonna move my, just got, got ahead of myself here, hold on. These controls are very sensitive. Okay, what do we know about ADHD? So ADHD is an umbrella term uh, for three types of ADHD. Um, inattentive, hyperactive, impulsivity, and combined. Um, inattentive, the symptoms for inattentive ADHD, um, typically um, people have trouble with focusing, they may be disorganized. They're not going to have the behavioral um, challenges. They, they may even go under the radar. Um, they have a, have trouble with um, um, attention, paying attention to details. Um, and I find that some sometimes girls are fall under. They're, they're not they're not diagnosed until much later because they have the inattentive ADHD. The hyperactive impulsive um, part of ADHD is where you have 
a lot of energy. It's almost like um, you have a big motor in your body and you have small brakes. There's a lot of restlessness, tons of energy, and you're constantly moving. That's the hyperactive impulsivity of ADHD. And then there are some people who are diagnosed with the combined, the two, the, 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 the two above, inattentive and hyperactive impulsivity. The disorder affects about 8 to 10 percent of um, children, and it does continue into adulthood. And it can occur with other conditions such as anxiety, depression, OCD, that's obsessive compulsive disorder, ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, learning disabilities, and bipolar. It is a complex brain disorder. Um, it just means that your the, the chemical messengers are not working properly. It, it's an underactive brain. Um, Russell Barkley, he's an expert um, psychologist in ADHD. He, 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 his, research, his research has found that 89 to 95% of the individuals with ADHD will have executive function impairment. So having ADHD goes hand in hand with executive function deficits. So it's a common problem for ADHD brains. And we're gonna take a look at what those executive skills are. And um, you can have executive function deficits, but not have ADHD. It can be a result of traumatic brain injury, um, maybe stroke, um, or, or just maybe the natural process of aging. And you can see from this um, graph that the executive skills reside in what we call the prefrontal cortex of the brain. It's the front part of the brain. So any damage in that area is going to impact the executive skills. So what are executive functions? Well, they're really high-level brain cognitive mental functions that are needed um, to regulate and direct your behavior towards a set of activity or task. It's what we call the um, self-management system of the brain. So think of it like the conductor of an orchestra. Um, the conductor is uh, responsible for directing various groups of instruments bringing them in to make a beautiful uh, piece of music, symphony. Um, the conductor um, coordinates the pace, the intensity of the music. So executive function is like the conductor of an orchestra. It is a, it's a self-management function. Um, it is important for the success in the home, school, work place. Essentially, it's, it's, your, it's, it's your life skills. So um, what are executive functions? I really like these definitions um, that are defined by Peggy Dawson and Richard Guire. They're, they've come up with about 11 definitions. They're discrete and they're very specific. And sometimes I use these to show my clients and say, hey, where do you think you're having um, trouble? Where are your challenges? So let's go through each one of these executive functions. So remember, if you have executive, so if you have ADHD, you are going to have some deficit in these executive functions. Um, let's take a look at working memory. So working memory is the part of the memory where you have to hold information long enough to do something with that information, to process it. Think of having to remember a phone number long enough for you to dial that phone number. Or if you um, get lost and you need directions, someone gives you directions, you need to hold that information long enough to execute it to implement it. And working memory is essential for um, math, 
learning the different uh, formulas, holding the formulas in the in memory in order to um, carry out that formula, to work it out. Um, it's important for reading comprehension. It's, it's, it's essential for learning. That's working memory. Planning, prioritizing another's executive function. It's it's building, it's how you can it's how you build a roadmap to get to your goal or to execute a task. Prioritizing is understanding what's what's important, what's not important, what's relevant, not irrelevant, and being able to sequence it. Organization. Um, when I think of organization, I don't. I, I think of setting up organizational system to manage your physical belongings, but I also think about being able to organize and sequence your thoughts. A lot of times I have students who come in and say they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed with um, the work. Um, they're overwhelmed with um, what they have to do. They, they don't know how to organize their thoughts sequence them, maybe prioritize them because their working memory is weak. Now, working memory, planning, prioritizing, organization, I think are very important inputs for decision-making. So I, I, I definitely think that it um, decision-making or good decision-making can be impacted. Time management is another executive function. It's the ability to um, estimate time, um, to manage your time, maybe keep appointments, um, manage deadlines, structure time in order for you to get things done. Um, metacognition is just a fancy word to um, describe your ability to evaluate yourself to stand back and um, assess how you're doing and make adjustments to what you're doing, all right? It's, it's self-monitoring, it's, it's um, learning from your mistakes. I don't know if any of you have maybe people in your life who don't seem to learn from their mistakes. They seem to repeat the same mistake over and over again. You're wondering, didn't you learn from your mistake? <laughs> Um, number six, task initiation and shifting. This is a big one. Getting started. Um, the inability to get started leads to procrastination, avoidance, deferral. Um, so task initiation is an executive function. I, I, I think a lot of times people are unable to get started for a number of reasons, but um, they can't activate themselves. They know they need to get started, but they just can't get themselves activated to start a task. Flexibility and adaptability um, is just being able to shift gears under changing maybe situations and circumstances. Um, uh, I don't know. I I I I. I do see some of my clients uh, being a little bit rigid, uh, maybe not being open to trying new ways, um, or maybe uh, a little bit nervous about trying different systems. It's that kind of inability to flex and adapt to changing situations, environments. Sustained attention is just being able to focus um, especially if a task is boring, um, tedious, are they able to maintain attention and focus and persist on a task? Most people or some people are able to sustain attention um, on tasks that are not stimulating, right? But for individuals with ADHD, that is it is, is, is really difficult, it's challenging. Emotional control, it's just the ability to manage emotions in order to achieve your goals and complete task, even if you're tired. Maybe, you, maybe there's been some social drama in your life 
that can completely derail people if they're not able to control their emotions. Response inhibition is the um, capacity to think before you act or, or before you say anything. Some people can't, don't have a filter. They just blurt out whatsoever is on their mind. It's that ability to think before you act or say. And then the last one is goal-directed persistence, which is being able to persist in order to meet a goal, to, 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 to um, uh, channel your energy, channel your time towards a particular task. It could be a short-term goal or a long-term goal or a task. Sometimes persistency is very challenging and can be mentally and cognitively exhausting. So these are the executive functions or skills that are needed for daily living. Okay, so ADHD is an impairment of performance and self-regulation. So it's not only about um, concentrating and focusing. I love this term. It's not just attention deficit, it's intention deficit. That's a term that Russell Barkley um, came up with, indicating that some individuals, they know what they need to do, but they just can't do it. Or they just, um, their intentions is just misplaced. Um, I also want to point out, and this is very um, important for people who have ADHD, um, having ADHD and poor executive skills has nothing to do with intelligence. You can have a very high Q, I, IQ, but you have just poor self-regulation abilities. So they, 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 are, they are separate. Um, and a lot of times they do point out to my clients names of people in the business world, in the entertainment industry who have ADHD and who have been extremely successful. So there is hope. Um, it has nothing to do with intelligence. Um, and each individual is unique. And as you can see, ADHD is complex. It has those comorbid conditions. And on top of that, um, executive function deficits, they can vary in, diff vary in strengths and deficits. So I, I, I want to um, just show this, um, this, this graph to you. I thought this was interesting because um, sometimes we observe a behavior and we may misunderstand that behavior, especially if that person is struggling with ADHD. All right, um, behind that behavior may be poor or weak executive functions. So when we see a child or a person um, that appear to be lazy, it could be because they have weak um, attention skills or, or goal-directed persistent um, skills. They're not able, or, or I would even say, maybe they're not able, they have weak task initiation skills. They're not able to get themselves activated to do what they need to do. If they're messy, poor organization skills, that's, that's related to the executive function of organization. Um, I'm just picking a, a few of these out. I'm not gonna go over each one, but forgetfulness, working memory. If your working memory is weak, you're going to forget instructions. You're going perhaps maybe you're going to lose things, misplace things, forget where you put things. Um, you're you're not maybe um, evaluating. No, you're not self-aware. Met metacognition. So think about the behavior and what's behind the behavior. Um, I also want to show you this. This was an interesting graph. It's called the homework cycle. Um, and it shows about seven steps a student needs to take 
in order to get their homework done. We don't usually think about um, the steps of completing homework. We just assume that the student gets assigned and they go home and they just get it done. But for someone who has ADHD and those weak executive skills, this is challenging. All right, so if I can go through this homework cycle, I don't know if you can see it on your end. It's a little bit blurry. Um, but it starts with the student, I'm sorry, the teacher assigning the homework. All right, the teacher assigns the homework. Now the student has to record the assignment accurately and in sufficient detail. So we're going to have to remember to record it. That's working memory. The student then has to ensure all materials needs to needed to complete the work is brought home. So again, have to remember what homework I have and what are the materials or um, uh, supplies I need to bring home in order to get that work completed. Again, possibly using our organizational skills and working memory. Three, the student plans for the completion of homework and studying for tests. Student needs to know, okay, what do I have going on after school? Do I have any extracurricular activities? Uh, when am I going to do this? Four, student manages time after school effectively. All right, so time management. Um, student needs to um, figure out, okay, what do I have? Um, how much time do I have? If I have a test, an essay, worksheets, am I going to get it done tonight, given that I've had soccer practice? Five, student physically completes work and ensure that it is accurate. So this involves sustained attention, task initiation. He's got to get started on it. How many of you have heard, oh, I'll do it later, or either avoided, deferred the work because task initiation is so, it's an executive skill and it's, it's sometimes hard for them to activate. Um, the um, number six student ensures that materials and assignments are brought back to school. Now they've got to remember, they've got to pack their work and they've got to submit it. I've had a lot of students, they've done the work, they've completed it, but then they forget to hand it in and they lose credit for it. Um, and then the next day, if it's, I, know, I know a lot of um, homework is now being submitted electronically and that's a whole different, I guess, ball game because now the student is having to manage a, a digital world right there's less paperwork less physical um, handouts that they need to actually hand in now they're managing an abstract digital world um, number seven is if they have physical papers they need to remember to hand that in so we're using our working memory so this i thought this was a great um um, diagram of the homework completion cycle. Um, and, and, and don't forget, with every single piece of homework they get, they're going to have to go through these seven steps and, and use their executive skills in order to complete their homework. Uh, just one thing I want to mention that is students up to 12th grade, the only time they have to manage is the only time they have to manage is when they come back from school. From eight to three, their time is managed. Their classes are set. They just have to follow the schedule. So that can also be very challenging for them. Um, as far as doing class work, um, they're told to get started on class work. So they're, they're being prompted. But when you think about college students, this is gonna be extremely challenging then their time is not managed. They're only in class. I like to use the 20 or 80, 20 rule. In high school or up to 12th grade, you're in your 80% of your time is managed. 20% of the time you, the student manage only 20% of the time. When you get to college, 
you have to manage 80% of the time. And you're only in class maybe 20 to 30% of the time. So this, this is going to be, college students have a huge challenge, especially if you have weak executive skills. Okay, um, just moving forward. Um, implications for adult ADHD. Um, adults, your brain, the brains are fully um, developed by late 20s or early 30s. Uh, but, but symptoms may still exist and continue. So uh, some adults have learned to compensate. Um, they've learned their own strategies um, to help them with their weak executive skills. However, as an adult, you now, you're not having to deal with the homework um, cycle. <laughs> yeah, you have more responsibilities. And decision-making, you've got a career to manage. If you have children, you've you've got to deal, you've got to manage and care for other people's lives. You've got parenting um, concerns and issues. You've got to manage your household, bills, chores, house projects, relationships, friendships, finances, and other goals. So um, the implications for adult is that you're there's, there's a lot more for you to manage. And it's important to have a sense of control, um, some good decision-making skills and, and better self-awareness. Hopefully those metacognition skills, um, you, you're, you are evaluating yourself, monitoring your progress and learning from your mistakes. So um, here's just a summary of um, the characteristics of poor executive skills. Um, disorganized, maybe you don't have a good organizational system, maybe your space is a mess, forgetfulness, um, tend to misplace, lose belongings, forget instructions, directions, what you've learned, maybe have trouble getting started and staying on task, um, time blind, maybe lack sense of time and it's important, importance. Um, gets easily distracted and off task, um, rush through work, don't pay attention to details, maybe make silly mistakes or dawdle, maybe, maybe stretch out an assignment that could take five minutes, stretch it out to like an hour because you're getting distracted. Don't know where to start on long-term projects. Um, feeling overwhelmed, you have a big project, just don't know where to begin. Procrastinate, procrastination, avoid, delay, defer, and can be rigid, find it hard, managing emotions and impulses. So these are some of the characteristics of poor executive skills. Um, I wanna talk about some tips and strategies for support. Um, these tips and strategies um, obviously have to be age appropriate um, and maybe adapted depending whether you're um, using them for a young child or teenager um, or an adult. Um, so the first one is just start small, create opportunities for success. And this is important because I find that a lot of people who are, struggling with ADHD and weak executive functions, um, their, their confidence is shattered. <laughs> their their, their self-esteem, um, their poor self-esteem, um, they feel they have a, they feel a sense of failure and they just don't like a lot of accomplishments. So you want to build in opportunities for success. So what we can do is maybe break assignments or difficult activities into smaller, manageable tasks. And I put down here an, an essay. Writing an essay for a student can be overwhelming because there's so many components to it. So we try to make the barrier to entry low. Think, suggest a very low um, barrier for entry. Maybe let's just think of a topic. Just for now, let's think of a topic that you would like to write about. 
then we can talk about maybe the outline or maybe going into doing some research. You can break assignments by task or time. All right. So time, it could be, uh, for example, doing a math worksheet. Maybe let's just let's just just do question number one. Start with the first question. Let's just complete that. Or you can say, let's just do five minutes. I call it the furious five. Furious five is just in that five minutes, do as much as you can. At the end of the five minutes, let's see where we are. Maybe we can continue for another five minutes. So breaking it down into smaller sub subtasks may be more, is more manageable. It's easily digestible. Setting goals together. Um, I think it's important to set goals in order to develop ownership and accountability. And we can use those um, SMART criteria, like make the goal specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. So um, I have, when I work with my students, we do goal setting, and a lot of them will say, I want to get all A's this semester. Um, that That's pretty loaded. So we try to break that down to say, okay, what does that mean to get A's all semester? We need to first maybe know what we have each evening, identify what those assignments are. We need to be able to start them and complete them that evening and also submit it, right? So, so those could be three sub goals or three goals. Or, or it could be we just work on one. Let's make sure that we know every evening what we have for homework. That might mean checking your school portals, Google Classroom, maybe Canvas, email, or even if teachers don't post on the school portal, making sure that you have your listening ears to write it down if they verbally disseminate that information. All right, so setting goals um, allows them to contribute to the process. Hopefully they will um, develop ownership. Um, number three, write tasks, goals down and keep in visual field. This will help to support weak working memory. There's a phrase out of sight, out of mind. If you don't see it, you're probably not gonna do it. So we need to move our tasks from the abstract to the concrete, from here to a place where we can see it. So we want to externalize the information and concept so we can see it, it's in our visual field. Um, we want to provide, um, uh, I call them prosthetics, right, in the environment, right, uh, using visual aids, like calendars, checklists, sticky notes, diagrams, right, to minimize that, if I don't see it, I'm going to forget it, out of sight, out of mind. For example, I know um, we have sometimes used luggage luggage, the luggage tags on backpacks to remind um, students what they need to bring home. All right, um, I, I have this um, phrase here, do a brain dump. Um, sometimes we use that activity as a way to um, dump everything that's here onto paper. Once it's on paper, we can sort it. We can organize it. We can prioritize it because now they can see it. It's in their visual field. All right. So it's really important to externalize that information, right, from abstract to the concrete. Um, number four, teach time management awareness skills. This is really important. This is an important <laughs> skill for our students, especially as we prepare them for college. I think um, 
college students need time management skills because they will have a lot of time, um, more time um, at college than they will at, um, during in high school. Um, and, it, and it's also awareness, being aware of time. You know, what does half an hour feel like? I, 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 I um, say, you know, half an hour is like a sitcom, though I'm not too sure whether people watch TV anymore. Um, and, and so helping them to plan to structure themselves or structure time, right? Schedule themselves for activities, keep planners. Um, I, I think up to middle school, they make students use a, a assignment pairs, but then, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, no, they, they actually teach um, students to use assignment plans up to elementary school, but once they get into middle school and, and high school, they, they don't really enforce it. So I, if, if you have a, uh, child in uh, sixth through 12th grade, I would certainly enforce using planners. And I, to be honest with you, I don't care whether it's a paper planner or whether it's a digital planner, whether it's an app, um, they need some kind of time management tool. Um, creating good habits and routine and be consistent. This is a tough one. Um, start early creating routines. Uh, for example, your routine for after school, what is that going to look like? Right, the homework routine that helps to provide structure and to manage expectations. You know, good habits take about six to eight weeks to form and cement. So if we do it day in, day out, hopefully they will grab onto it and they will can, they can do this on their own. Um, for someone, um, older, uh, maybe college, um, it's maybe um, keeping um, your, um, your schedule, maybe creating a schedule in college for when you're going to be studying um, and, and, and being consistent. That's the, that's the hardest part, being consistent. Um, number six, practice self-evaluation and self-reflection. Um, Ask yourself, how did I do? What did I learn? What went well for me today? What did not go well for me today? And what would I repeat, right? Learn from your past experience, good and bad, right? Uh, and this is gonna be extremely helpful as you move into adulthood because then you can develop your own strategies and help yourself. We tend to um, work in a more of a reactive mode as opposed to a, a proactive mode. We react, but we don't take time to evaluate how did we do. All right, so self-evaluation is important to try to build in everyday life. And then the last one um, is externalized motivation. Sometimes it's really hard to motivate yourself to do something you're not interested in especially homework. When you think about homework and maybe reading, um, those tasks are not stimulating for our um, students, right? Compared to video games, compared to being on social media, right? Where you can get all these likes and, um, you know, comments. Now find ways to, if it's a young child, find ways to reward or incent them. And I'm not looking for giving you know big huge prizes, but maybe deferring video games to later, right? You want them to teach. You want them to um, find ways to self motivate, to defer certain um, activities in order to get the work done, so you can be rewarded. All right, I hope that um, makes sense. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is ADHD, executive function coaching. Um, it, it, this, this can supplement current ADHD treatment. I have a lot of clients who are taking um, medication 
while receiving executive function coaching. However, I do have some clients who say, you know what, before I decide on medication or um, other treatments, I would like to try executive function coaching. Um, it's non-clinical or therapeutical, therapeutic, meaning I don't deal with medication and I don't deal with, I don't, I'm not a therapist. Um, my, my role is to come alongside that individual, collaborate with them, provide, uh, maybe develop some skills. It could be academic skills, study skills, time management, organizational skills, um, maybe offer guidance and strategies to support executive function challenges, maybe brainstorm with them what's worked, what did not work, help them with um, uh, solving problems. Um, my goal is always to, um, especially with the younger children, to move them towards self-management. My eye is always on how are they going to operate when they're in college and to develop those skills so that they can self-manage. You know, children and teens, while they are living at home, they have a lot of executive function support. That Sometimes their parents are their executive function coaches. They tell them when they have to start homework, when they can, when they should, you know, um, uh, stop certain activities, stop video games, even at school, teachers stop chatting, move on to this activity. There's a lot of, there's, there's some level, certain level of executive function um, support in schools. However, once you get into college, um, the student is pretty much on their own. Um, so executive function coaches help with developing accountability, ownership, and helping them to keep on track and focus on their goals. Um, okay, so it's about quarter to one. Um, I'm going to just share um, with two um, examples of clients I've worked with. This is Mike. Uh, his name has been changed to preserve his confidentiality. Um, he's a senior in high school. He's juggling schoolwork and also college applications. So this is a very busy semester for him. Um, he is diagnosed with ADHD and also ASD, autism spectrum disorder. He's an AB student. So I have a lot of students who look really good on paper. A students taking AP classes, um, high GPA, this particular young man, is intelligent, he's high functioning, um, has a high interest in the science, he's very motivated, he looks great on paper. However, he struggles with procrastination, um, he gets easily overwhelmed with work, he has poor time management skills, um, he had been missing deadlines, forgetting to submit work, um, and his mom is worried about his transition to college life. So while he is doing okay in high school, she is projecting at how is he going to manage when he um, moves to um, college. And that's a valid concern. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's um, done you know, very well in high school, um, but, uh, college can be very challenging. So with Mike, um, what I ended up, what we ended up working on, uh, because he came to me over the summer, he had not finished his summer AP work. He also had a huge certification test that he needed to study for. He hadn't, hadn't done any of the studying and this was a critical certification he wanted to pass. We had a lot of catch up to do, um, but we really worked on him um, working with the calendar because of this semester with a lot of deadlines with college applications and with um, school work. Um, it was a good time for him to develop the habit and also the skills and the um, 
um, kind of um, seeing the benefits of managing a calendar. So we've been working with plotting all the dates, um, including his work schedule, including his commitments to science clubs. Um, he has been doing absolutely wonderful with that, able to meet his deadlines with college apps, applications, and keeping up with his schoolwork. There were other things we worked on, but that was a um, an area that we worked together, helping him with managing his time. And that's going to go a long way when he moves to college. I have another client here, Mary. Um, that's not her real name. Ma Mary is a mom. She has two teens. She was recently diagnosed with ADHD. Um, she had suspected that she had ADHD after her, her one of her child was also diagnosed. And she came to me feeling very overwhelmed with um, household management, um, volunteer work that she did with the schools, um, projects, school projects, house projects, bills, finances, you know, meal preparation, parenting, and so on. Um, she says she's very easily distracted and finds that she starts one task and don't finish it. Um, so she has a lot of unfinished chores, lacks organization and prior prioritizing skills. And she indicated she hates this. And I, I added this because there are a lot of people, adults who have um, used their own strategies, but um, hasn't worked for them. She says that this makes her stressful, that it reminds her of all the things that she has not accomplished. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that we did work on is her prioritizing skills. Um, I did make her create a list. We did a, a brain dump. We dumped all the things that she had here onto paper, um, created a list, a five-page list of all the things that she was overwhelmed with. Um, once she, once we had that, we were able to sort it. And we just said, you know what, Mary, take one thing from that list and see if you can maybe execute it. Complete one thing, choose one or two things. So we broke it down into shorter, smaller subtasks. We're working with other um, areas. She's also been able to consistently develop some good routines around some of her household chores. Um, and um, she's in a better place, but um, life is always changing and moving. Um, but she's been able to accomplish uh, several um, personal um, um, areas in her life. At this point, um, I'm going to open up for questions. So if you would like to post any questions in the q and I'd be happy to answer them. I'm curious, when I went through that list of executive functions, whether any of you could relate to any one of them based on people you know who have ADHD, were there anything that strike you? Okay, so um, okay, so here a question here: What is the best process for exploring ADHD with a school for a young child? Um, the young child is grade two, so that's seven, eight years old. Um, this is my. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna give you my opinion. 
um, and, I'm, and this is not medical advice. <laughs> this is based on what I have seen, my experience. Um, if you suspect that your child has ADHD, um, I would probably speak to your doctor about it. I do feel that grade two, that seven, eight years old, um, the, 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 the child is still maturing. Their brain is still developing. Sometimes what a child does is just immaturity. Um, however, if you you feel if you feel that this child has ADHD, I would I would speak to your doctor and ask for their um, their their advice. Um, and they they have an ex extensive evaluation, and I I know MedSite does also comprehensive um, testing for ADHD. But I do feel that children in elementary school, um, their brains are still developing. Um, I, I've, I've seen differences where um, children have um, presented ADHD symptoms and by the time they are maybe college, they're doing exceptionally well. They're, they're doing great. They're just, they were just immature. Uh, another question, my son, Flat out refuses to sit down with me to map out homework. He is 13. Okay. It may mean um, at 13, he's a teenager. Teenagers don't like their parents <laughs> helping them. That's what I found. There's a resistance for parents to intervene. And that is very natural. That's not about you. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's the adolescence phase. They they want to do it on their own. And I think at this age, sometimes you might need someone else to help you out with that. Maybe a teacher. Maybe you've spoken to the teacher. Uh, ADHD coach is sometimes a person who, outside the family, who he might respect, he might listen, um, who could possibly help. But that's, I think that's quite normal. Um, will you be able to, will you be sharing this slide show with us? I'd like to be able to reread it and possibly share with my therapist to set goals. Um, I think we can, yeah, we could do that. I don't know if you can um, maybe send, you, send me your email. That would be helpful. I'll be happy to share my slideshow with you. Um, okay, time management is especially problematic since perception of time changes over time. Do you have suggestions for, for standardizing time frame so it becomes easier to estimate how long it would take to complete a task? It often feels I simply schedule too much. Um, I don't, there are, I don't have suggestions for standardizing timeframes. However, I do work on helping. One of the things I do um, advise is when you take a task, you do need to scope the task, meaning you need to evaluate how much work is this task? All right, so... For example, um, let's take, I'm gonna take an example of cleaning your, cleaning the kitchen, all right? I gotta clean the kitchen. You gotta evaluate how much work is this gonna involve? What is the scope? Am I gonna be cleaning out the all the drawers with all the knives and forks or am I just gonna be cleaning out one of the cupboards? All right, evaluate how much work is that task and then try to estimate how long will that take me? I do that a lot with um, homework, math worksheet. I'll ask a student, how long do you think it's gonna take you based on your past experiences? 
Some of them will say, oh, it takes me five minutes. But it takes you five minutes to open up your computer. All right. So, 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 so you have 10 questions. Are you good at math? No, I'm lousy at math. I, I don't really understand it. Well, it may take you more than five minutes. It could take you 30 minutes. There's 10 questions. It could take 30 minutes based on your, um, your, your weakness or your strength in math. I don't know whether that helped you, but it is important to evaluate the scope of the work, figure out what's involved, and then try to estimate time that's going to take you. Um, do you have advice for adults that struggle with time blindness? I find I struggle more living alone with an external source presence to recognize time passing or help me switch tasks. Um, I do work, I work with a lot. Of, I, I suggest working with timers. Um, Um, or, or, or using alarms. So if you, you know, um, I'm just thinking of um, an activity. Say if you need to be, I don't know, at an appointment at a certain time, you might want to figure out how long it's going to take you to get to that appointment and put a timer or an alarm to remind you. Or if you struggle with time blindness, maybe have an alarm that goes off every 30 minutes to remind you that 30 minutes has just passed. I'm just brainstorming here. <laughs> but using timers, alarms, is a reminder for you of how much time has passed. Um, sometimes um, if you're working on an activity or say you're doing a chore or task, you might want to say, let me estimate how long this is going to take me. I think it's going to take me an hour and put a timer for an hour and see if you can get it done within an hour. I'm hoping that helps you a little bit. Okay, all right, okay. Um, another person, help me understand the impact of medication on the prefrontal cortex and neurotransmitters. I think that's more of a, um, uh, a question for your um, doctor, they will be able to um, help you out with that. Um, I do know that there are stimulants um, that may um, help with the neurotransmitter, maybe for them to be more, um, um, connect more. Uh, I don't know all the, the mechanics about it. I, I don't really deal with medication, I'm sorry, um, but, but uh, medication um, helps those um, linkages be much more stronger, if that's the right word. I'm not too sure if I'm using the right words for that. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for joining me. I hope that this presentation has been helpful. Um, and I'm, I'm just sharing you with you what I have learned in the past 12 years. Hopefully you can apply some of that to your own lives or your children's lives or other people's lives. You know, if you're a professional, hopefully this has been helpful to you and your clients. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining me, me today. Thank you.